Hello, this is Annette Weber, and today's podcast will be about hepatic physiology and uh, implications on anesthesia management. The learning objectives of this podcast are to review hepatic anatomy and blood flow, blood flow regulation, uh, we review what we know about hepatic function, and we'll discuss hepatic function assessment. Then we'll discuss what we know about the anesthesia effect on hepatic function and how this may modify our anesthesia management to protect liver function. So first, here is our organ. Here is what we know about hepatic anatomy. There's a left lobe, a right lobe. The structures, vascular structures of importance are the inferior vena cava at the posterior portion of the liver, uh, incoming blood flow from hepatic artery and portal vein, outgoing blood flow, hepatic veins which drain into the inferior vena cava. The histological organization of uh, liver tissue also is worth mentioning. The hexagonal hepatic lobe um, is organized in a very certain way to optimize metabolic function um, and oxygen supply. Uh, the organization is uh, shown here in this slide. At the corners you have branches from the portal vein, hepatic artery and bile duct. In the middle there's the central vein which drains into the hepatic veins and then IVC. The liver is the largest gland we have in the body and weighs approximately between 1.2 to 1.5 kilo. The hepatic blood flow is approximately 1.5 liters of blood per minute, which represents about 20 to 25 percent of cardiac output. The hepatic artery, which derives from the celiac artery in most cases, can also originate from the superior mesenteric artery is one of the incoming blood vessels. Um, also blood flow will be um, provided by the portal vein which unites the whole venous return from almost the entire GI tract except the rectum so therefore it's bringing the nutrient rich blood. The distribution will discuss very soon. Um, the hepatic veins return the hepatic um, blood to uh, the systemic circulation. The right and left hepatic vein join very close to the diaphragm uh, into the drain into the IVC. Therefore, the distance between hepatic vein and interthoracic cavities be close. The hepatic venous return is therefore very much exposed to alteration in the interthoracic pressure. Hence, if you have right heart dysfunction, uh, you may easily have uh, a congested liver and enlarged liver. So the liver outflow is very sensitive to right heart impairment and, and or elevated interthoracic pressure. The liver is organized in lobules. Um, cancer veins are like 50,000 to 100,000 discrete anatomic units, which is called lobules. So let's come back to the hepatic blood flow. The hepatic artery provides around one third of total hepatic blood flow, but brings more than 50% of uh, oxygen towards the liver. The portal vein brings plus minus two thirds of the hepatic blood flow and brings less oxygen, but brings the nutrients. The hepatic artery is auto-regulated by metabolic and um, uh, vascular mechanisms. And the hepatic artery compensates for fluctuation in pulmonary vein blood flow. We'll explore it in our next slide. It's called the hepatic artery buffer response. So while the hepatic artery is more or less auto-regulated, the pulmonary vein blood flow actually is much more regulated by the nutrient contents in this uh, GI system. 
The hepatic artery has a huge regulation of alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors and dopaminergic receptors, while the portal vein has much less a regulation uh, and is somewhat still affected by alpha-1 and dopaminergic receptors. If beta blockers are given, the hepatic artery blood flow decreases, and so therefore uh, the portal venous pressure decreases, and that's why it's used a uh, mainstream treatment for portal hypertension. So what's this hepatic artery buffer response? Just due to physiology, due to our eating intervals, we don't eat constantly, there's a lot of variation in the portal vein blood flow. Since the liver likes a continuous oxygen delivery and uh, blood flow, um, any variation in portal vein flow will be compensated by the hepatic artery, which means if we are just postprandial, our portal vein flow will increase and therefore the hepatic artery blood flow will decrease. Other way around, if, the port, if we are fasting, the portal vein flow therefore is going to be reduced, so therefore the hepatic artery flow will be increased. Goal is to have the total hepatic blood flow as constant as possible with auto regulation. Surely there are some limits. Okay, how much can I be to dilate uh, coming to the hepatic artery uh, response? Uh, what we have identified is that the mechanism is driven by adenosine, which is secreted by the liver sinusoids, that causes hepatic arterial dilation and therefore affects the hepatic artery blood flow. But here comes the caveat to that. This is a very one-sided relationship. So while changes in portal vein flow and nutrient content affect the flow in the hepatic artery, it doesn't go the other way around, meaning if the hepatic artery blood flow is compromised, the portal vein will not respond. So let's review the hepatic physiology. The hexagonal hepatic lobe is organized in a way to optimize and link metabolic function with oxygen supply. The central of the lobe is a branch of the central vein, which will drain the venous blood to the hepatic veins. At the corners, the portal triad, there are branches of portal vein, hepatic artery, and bile duct in those Portal triads are located at every corner of this hexagon. Based on this distribution, there are different zones defined. Zone 1 is oxygen rich, and so therefore, a lot of metabolic functions which are requiring more oxygen will be located in zone 1. The zone 3 is more oxygen poor, closer to the hepatic vein and uh, therefore metabolic functions with less oxygen demands will be organized and located there. So what are the hepatic functions? The liver is a major player in our glucose homeostasis. It is the major site for glucose formation from lactate, amino acids, mostly alanine, and glycerol, which is derived from fat metabolism. The hepatic gluconeogenesis is primarily responsible for maintaining a normal constant glucose concentration. And there's some form of anesthesia effect on um, uh, the gluconeogenesis, which can be inhibited by genetic. In addition to the glucose formation, the liver also is a major player for the glycogen storage. So when glucose is absorbed after a meal, in the nutrient rich it, uh, blood is transported to the liver, the liver has the ability to store the excess as glycogen. And then the storage capacity is ex uh, exhausted, 
excess glucose is then converted into fat tissue. Insulin enhances the glycogen synthesis, while epinephrine or glucagon enhances the glycogen lysis. As a ballpark, uh, the liver contains about 65 gram per kilo of glucagon. Average glucose consumption, assuming it's about 150 gram a day, um, you can go 48 hours of fasting until your glucagon storage is depleted. So that just gives you a huge reserve for when you don't find food. In addition to the glucose homeostasis, the liver also is a major uh, organ for the protein metabolism. The liver is responsible for the deamination of amino acids, for the formation of urea when uh, to eliminate the ammonia uh, secondary to uh, the uh, amino acid metabolism. Also, non-essential amino acids are interconverted in the liver. And for us, most importantly, plasma proteins are produced in the liver. All plasma proteins except immunoglobins are produced in the liver. That includes, for the perioperative management, albumin, clotting factors, not only the ones to make clots, but also to dissolve clots, including protein S, protein C, in plasma schwannendosteresis. So by virtually all plasma proteins, with the exception of immunoglobins, are for, uh, produced in the liver. Probably the most important one for us is albumin. Roughly 10 to 15 grams per day of albumin are synthesized in the liver. Albumin is important to maintain our colloid osmotic pressure, as well as transporting proteins and binding proteins, binding drugs. The liver produces all coagulation factors. The hepatocytes produce all coagulation factors except factor eight. Factor eight, however, is produced in the liver sinusoidal cells. I already mentioned the plasma schwannesterase, but also antithrombin three, alpha one antitrypsin, transferrin, haptoglobin, uh, seroplasmin also are produced by the liver important proteins for us when it comes to the perioperative management. Carbohydrates and fat um, metabolism also are important uh, to be mentioned in the liver function. Um, the liver is responsible for the synthesis of the, plasma, the lipoproteins, which are transport vehicles for lipids, uh, synthesis of cholesterol, phospholipids as a component of the cell membrane uh, that you know, to, to remember. Okay, so let's talk about the drug metabolism and detoxification. As I already alluded to in the liver histology, the metabolic functions in the liver are um, somehow located towards oxygen availability to match oxygen availability with nutrients. So in phase one, phase one reactions, these are the ones which need oxygen. Um, it's either oxidation, reduction, deamination, uh, self-oxygenation, dealkalization, or methylation. And as listed here, there are a bunch of anesthetic drugs which need a phase one reaction. And that would be in the periportal zone, zone one, um, to mention a few functions which need uh, P450, um, cytochrome, or oxygenation. The gluconeogenesis and glycogenesis, that's located in uh, zone one. Cholesterol synthesis, the beta oxygenation of fatty, amino, uh, fatty acids, uh, the amino acid degradation to, uh, to enter the urea cycle. That would be all in uh, zone one. Phase two reaction, this is more like when it needs to be conjugated with something to make water soluble to be excreted. So conjugation with glucoride, sulfate, tyrene, or glycine. Okay. They're not that oxygen dependent. So ketogenesis would be here in zone three. Uh, the biotransformation, biotransformation of uh, drugs, chemicals, toxins. That's usually a phase two reaction located in zone three. 
overall the drug detoxification also happens in zone three. The zone in between, zone two, is a transition zone. Uh, it really regulates by oxygen availability in the substrate, uh, which reactions happen there. So how do we assess the competency of hepatic function? So some liver function tests, you know, AST, ALT, really are markers of hepatocellular damage. They tell you about liver tissue breakdown. We don't tell you much about liver function. Markers of cholestasis, the um, alkalic liver phosphorus, um, gamma GT, um, tell you about the biliary extraction system, but not really uh, specific to the cause. So when you look at liver synthetic function, you want to look at albumin production, since the liver is the only site of albumin synthesis. Power of albumin has a long half-life. It's also affected by nutrition, critical illness, protein loss, and hormonal imbalances. Not really very specific for if the liver is the problem if there are below albumin levels. More specific is looking at the coagulation factors, PT, INR. Since all of the coagulation factors except factor 8 are synthesized in hepatocytes. And then there's bilirubin. Bilirubin is formed by the reticular endothelial system as a part of the hemoglobin breakdown. After hemoglobin is broken down, bound to albumin, transport to the liver, and there it gets conjugated to glucuronic acid to be then converted into a water-soluble form to be excreted in the bile duct. The hepatocytes hmm, about produce about 500 cc's of bile fluid a day, but a lot of this gets reabsorbed since it is important for fat absorption. Coming back to what does the bilirubin tell me about liver function? The direct water soluble bilirubin can be measured and so therefore can give you an assessment of how well the excretion fact, uh, uh, function of the liver is. Also don't forget like the platelet number, um, a significant reduced uh, number in platelets can be a part of uh, portal hypertension and therefore an indication of liver fibrosis, cirrhosis. So let's review bilirubin connection with liver function. We have a patient postoperatively who has an elevated bilirubin level. Here's the differential diagnosis. Based on what type of bilirubin you find, you can identify if this is hepatic or non-hepatic. If you're non-conjugated bilirubin is elevated, the liver is not the problem. Okay, it's either hemolysis as an overproduction, okay, it can be impaired hepatic uptake, which there are some genetic abnormalities or medications which can cause that, or that your bilirubin conjunction system is impaired, uh, as there are syndromes where this is associated with. If your conjugated bilirubin is elevated, this can be either problems through exhausted or liver dysfunction, or there can be a biliary obstruction. Interhepatic causes for elevated conjugated bilirubin is either acute hepatitis, for several reasons, viral, alcoholic, or non-alcoholic, toxins, cancer, sepsis, total parental nutrition can cause that, biliary or primary biliary chungitis, or hepatocellular injury, um, either by uh, other mechanisms, can be causing that. So this is your differential diagnosis if you have an elevated bilirubin level. So how does anesthesia affect our hepatic physiology? Both general anesthesia and regional anesthesia have been reported to decrease the total hepatic blood flow can be either over cardiac output reduction, can be that the increased sympathetic tonus 
causes vasoconstriction. Reduced preload due to red hypertension can reduce hepatic blood flow. And also keep in mind the positive pressure ventilation due to the close connection of interthoracic pressure and hepatic veins. So positive pressure ventilation decreases preload, especially in a hypovolemic patient, and therefore can make increase your um, hepatic vein expression. Surgical stress also has been reported alone to reduce hepatic blood flow up to 60%. Also here the mechanisms may be sympathetic activation, local reflexes, or direct vascular compression. Pharmacologically, you know, what we use intraoperatively for various reasons, beta blocker, alpha-1 agonists, H2 blockers, and vasopressin all have reported to reduce hepatic blood flow. However, and that's why it's never an easy answer, if a patient is hypotensive and therefore hepatic blood flow is decreased due to hypotension, decreased cardiac output, alpha agonists or vasopressin actually may increase and optimize splenic blood flow. Again, it's not that easy. Low dose dopamine has been reported to be able to increase hepatic blood flow under the right circumstances. Again, you never know when you hit the dopamine receptor versus beta or alpha. So, um, uh, it is a possibility, but it also may cause vasoconstriction. So what is different when a patient has, in, in, what is different in anesthesia management when we know a patient has advanced liver cirrhosis? The dual blood supply to the liver, hepatic, uh, hepatic artery and uh, portal vein, now here with have liver cirrhosis, you already know that your portal vein blood flow is impaired. This organ is much more relying on the hepatic artery blood flow than a normal liver. Under those circumstances, you really have to avoid arterial hypotension. Due to the limited metabolic activity and ability to uh, metabolize uh, medications, uh, those patients have an increased susceptibility to narcotics, limited hepatic metabolism, but also Remember, the advanced, uh, uh, that advanced hepatic disease also has a lot of implication on cerebral blood flow and cerebral function, hepatic encephalopathy, etc., etc. Volatile anesthetics. The majority of research was focused on the effect of halothane on liver physiology and liver blood flow. Well, we don't use halothane anymore. Uh, the current beliefs, isoflurane is a good choice. It does not compromise hepatic uh, blood flow uh, significantly. Uh, but if you believe the more newer studies, propofol, desflurane, and sevoflurane are all good choices just because of also the shortened um, uh, pharmacokinetic in those medications. Since volatile anesthetic majority are eliminated by the respiratory system, the question is how much does the elimination really matter? Um, so the higher demands for isoflurane for metabolic uh, function may be just offset by the elimination through the respiratory system. For muscle relaxation, um, if you use succinic cooling in a patient with advanced liver disease, sodocholesterase is produced by the liver, so if you have impaired liver function, you may have a relative uh, pseudo is deficiency, and therefore prolonged succinic action. Procuronium is also partially metabolized by the liver and then renally excreted, where cis is completely organ-independent uh, metabolism. However, with Sugamadex, which does not rely on, uh, on uh, elimination of, of uh, rocuronium, um, we also have changed our consideration about using rocuronium on patients with advanced liver disease. Um, unless you are planning using Sugamadex, probably cisatocodium may be the better option. For every medication you use, your pharmacokinetics in a patient with advanced liver cirrhosis will depend on protein binding and the ability of uh, your liver to eliminate uh, that specific agent. 
and that depends on how much zone one versus zone three uh, function you will need. Obviously, zone three functions are much more reliable. Just receiving the recent uh, keywords from the interning exam in 2019. So these were just the five keywords they touched on. Hepatic blood flow regulation, biliary pressure and drug effects, post-hepatic uh, dysfunction assessment, um, what are the CNS effects and acute liver failure and opiate metabolism. You know, so it's a relevant topic uh, and it's consistently showing up in every interning exam and in primary certification exam. So I hope this podcast was helpful. If you have any questions about this content, please feel free to uh, email me um, and anytime um, available for questions and hopefully I have some answers. Uh, thank you very much and hope to talk to you about this soon.